Welcome everyone. My name is Evelyn Regan. I'm a senior admissions counselor at Rochester and I'm also a U of R alum. Welcome to the languages and cultures panel today. I have some wonderful um, faculty members with me here today who are experts in their field and are here to give you a bit more information about what it's like to study both classics and modern languages and cultures at the University of Rochester. So we'll start off with some introductions, um, but throughout the panel, feel free to use the Q&A box to write in any questions that you have pertaining to modern languages and cultures or classics. And I'll be moderating that and asking those questions when um, we're finished with those introductions. So Donatella, if you could start off. Okay, my name is Donatella Stocchi Perucchio. I teach Italian. Um, I funded the Italian program in uh, the Department of Modern Languages and Culture many years ago. And finally, uh, I can happily say that we have a major in Italian studies that is in place, in Italian and Italian studies. Um, I also <clears throat> funded a program abroad. It's uh, the only uh, faculty led the semester abroad, uh, completely managed and run by the U of R, offered by the U of R, and it's in Italy, and it's an integral part of this program in Italian and of this major in Italian. We also have summer programs connected to what we do here, and uh, they are all fully integrated. We like our students to study abroad with us, you know, with our same standards and same philosophy of education, so that's why we created this program. John, would you mind going next? Yes, sure. Hi, I'm John Gibbons. I'm professor of Russian and currently chair of the Department of Modern Languages and Cultures. And uh, so I have a, a nice uh, knowledge of numbers and overviews for the department. We are, I can just say a few things briefly now. We are the most popular humanities uh, department by numbers, enrollment numbers. Uh, and are about fifth or sixth ranked overall in total number of students enrolled in our department at any given semester. So a lot of students coming through the department interested in studying languages and cultures. And to give you just a, a sense for what, how that might translate, we average 191 clusters. That's something you'll find out about if you're a UR student. It's a way, the way that you fulfill uh, divisional requirements at the university. So we get 191 humanities clusters a year, uh, and we average 73 minors and 37 majors a year in our department. So a lot of students come through the department, very popular department. We offer uh, majors in seven uh, fields, uh, French, German, Italian, Japanese, Russian, Spanish, and comparative literature, along with minors in Chinese. And we also offer Korean, Portuguese, and Polish. Uh, in the department as well. You can take those as clusters. Thank you, John. And last but not least, Nick. I'm Nick Grayson. Uh, I'm a faculty member in the Department of Religion and Classics. So we're actually sort of two departments uh, joined at the hip, so to speak. Uh, so on the one hand, what I am is a classicist. So I, I teach Latin and ancient Greek, uh, as well as, as classics courses, um, mythology, uh, I don't teach ancient history, but we also have ancient history and, and other variety of, of classical civilization courses. Um, and uh, like Donatella, I also am involved in study abroad. Uh, I organized, uh, started a short-term study abroad program to Rome and then also to Athens, uh, which we now in our department alternate. Uh, these are over spring break, uh, so for students who are interested in um, and studying abroad, but don't have either the, uh, the time in their schedules. A lot of STEM students I know are worried about uh, the ability to, to um, take a semester off. Uh, over spring break, they can uh, travel to either Italy or, uh, or to, to Greece, depending on what year it is. Uh, obviously last year, we, we had to cancel our program to, to, to Rome, uh, which was too bad, but we're, we're hoping to reinstitute it next year. Um, and then, so that's the classic side. Uh, and then on the other side is the religious studies, uh, which actually has two majors, 
Uh, one is a sort of standard religious studies major, and now there's a, a new one that has just been approved, um, Religion and Society, I think it, something like that, uh, which is, uh, looks much more at the uh, sort of social aspects of religion and uh, issues of social justice and politics uh, within uh, the study of religion. Um, and uh, I think like MLC, uh, we have a, a good number of clusters that come through. A lot of students will, will fulfill their cluster, humanities clusters through uh, classics or through religion. Uh, and then oftentimes they sort of continue on and say, well, I've taken three courses, why don't I, or what I will do is I'll say, you've taken three, why not take a few more and make it a minor? And then at that point I sort of say, well, why don't you take a few more and, and you can make it a major. Uh, so I think we're a very popular uh, second major, particularly for students who, who come a little late to the, to the game and don't realize, oh, this stuff is actually really interesting and, and I get to think about uh, life through, through this different lens. Thank you all. So like I mentioned before, feel free to drop your questions into the Q&A box. The most important part of this session is that you get a better idea of what these two different departments have to offer and that your questions are answered about particular subjects. But in the meantime, I'll start off with some questions that I think a lot of students um, want to know. So we'll start off with a question about classes. So overall, what are classes like um, how would you say your classes have functioned within the current pandemic virtual learning situation? Uh, I'll, I'll start that one out actually, if you don't mind, Evelyn, and uh, say that the interesting thing about studying in modern languages and cultures and classics in terms of languages is that our departments offer you two kinds of knowledge. We offer you uh, a very practical skill in that we teach you proficiency in a language. Proficiency in a language is something you can put on a resume. It's a, it's a job skill. If, you, if your post UR time is going to, uh, your, your plans beyond graduation, your career plans involve uh, travel, international business, uh, or within the United States work with uh, with people who are speaking a different language, then this is a skill that we can impart. But you also get in our department uh, deep, active, robust intellectual engagement with the cultural products of these different national traditions that we teach. And this is the same in religion and classics. So it's a, it, it, our, our departments really satisfy both of your needs. You need sort of a practical knowledge and your need for this sort of personally transformative intellectual engagement, the kind of stuff that changes your life. That's a really broad way of looking at life in our, in our departments. I'll let my colleagues speak in more detail. So John, I think you, uh, you, you, you hit it on the head there that, although I will say that uh, maybe in, in, with Latin and Greek, uh, less, less in terms of practical knowledge, but certainly within a, a sort of a habit of mind, uh, one of the things I think practically speaking, not only do you, you gain fluency in a language, but I think studying other languages uh, is that you, much like studying mathematics or, or physics uh, or, or, or logic, that you, you develop a habit of mind and a, and a sort of um, a focus and discipline that I'm, I'm not sure you get in, in some other situations. So certainly with Latin and Greek, although I also will say that in religion and classics, uh, we also offer Arabic, uh, so modern Arabic, um, and then also modern Hebrew. So uh, those two can kind of fit into that, uh, that, that uh, category that you, you mentioned about practical skills. Uh, and then, yeah, I think that, that particularly with religion and then classics, which deals in sort of uh, big ideas and, and, and uh, important um, ideas in the history of humankind, uh, that these are things that we tackle. Uh, what is justice? Uh, what is equality? Um, I teach a course on democracy, and it's a comparative course between ancient democracy, that is the, the one practiced in ancient Athens, and modern democracy, which I think we, we are engaging with on a daily basis these days. Uh, and so those students who are in that class or who are in the class uh, that one of my colleagues teaches on justice and the justice system um, are really engaging with not just um, the sort of uh, 
abstract intellectual ideas, but ideas that are we are tackling um, that are seen in the news today, I think that are going to affect um, the way we view and the way we live um, in, in today's world. Well, we have a lot of connections uh, in terms of uh, what we do and the approaches. Uh, as far as uh, uh, our uh, mission in, in making students proficient in language, I always, uh, when, I, when I talk to students about what we do, I always tell them uh, what, what a language is. A language is a perspective on the world. So in addition to uh, providing special uh, uh, training in the, in the way our brains work, you know, and helping us in, in functioning logically and in, in all those ways that Unique described, a language gives us a perspective on the world. So to speak another language doesn't mean that you say the same thing in a different way, but that you see the world in a different way. And uh, the more you have in terms of these perspectives, the, the, the more you are equipped to deal with, with the reality that, that, that you are, uh, that you have in front of you. So uh, I insist on the fact that there is this plurality of, of visions that uh, uh, the study of languages provi um, uh, provides. And uh, the fact that uh, given uh, this, this particular aspect, uh, languages also give uh, a cultural literacy. So it's not just that, it, that you <laughs> talk to other people, but you, uh, present yourself, you, you, you present your identity and you interact with other identities with this cultural competence. Uh, so um, one major thing that needs to be dispelled is the idea that the language is something static and, 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 <laughs> and uh, isolated. So it is immersed in the, in the, in the world of, uh, uh, of culture, which is made of many things, is made of uh, History is made of uh, habits, is made of art, is made of uh, uh, specific ways in which people live. All these things are part of what we teach. And um, Nick, when you were talking about uh, the fact that uh, you managed to touch uh, all kinds of current problems and issues, that reminds me of uh, one uh, saying that runs uh, you know, among uh, historians uh, in Italy, that all history is contemporary history. So history is part of what we teach. And, and uh, even if it is the history of fascism, and you made me think about that because that's one thing that I teach. And uh, just a few weeks ago, we were talking about uh, education and politics. I cannot say that I'm a classicist, but I studied in a classical high school that was funded during fascism by the philosopher Gentile. And, uh, and so, yes, if I talk about democracy or non-democracy with my students, I go back to Athens too, and I go back to the inventors of the idea. And uh, so there is a lot of interdisciplinary um, uh, elements in, in what we do, and, and there are a lot of connections even among our disciplines. And, and Evelyn, if I could just add one last thing. I think characters do both departments. What does it mean to study in these departments? It also means uh, studying abroad. I mean, one of the first things you're gonna do when you get to campus is figure out how to get off campus. Mm -hmm. and we're talking about way off campus. So uh, whether you're going on a week spring break, a week long spring break program to Rome or to Athens with religion and classics, or on one of the summer programs uh, offered in the Modern Languages and Cultures run by UR faculty, uh, such as, uh, I'll give you a quick list. We, we have a pro uh, summer programs in Rennes, France, Berlin, Germany, uh, the island of Procida, Italy, Seoul, Korea. Uh, we run our program either in Quito, Ecuador, or Granada, Spain for Spanish, depending on the year. St. Petersburg, Russia. And we have the only faculty-led University of Rochester semester program that was founded by uh, Donatella uh, and has been running for some 20 something years in Arezzo, Italy. Uh, for all the summer programs, we have financial aid and fellowships because we know you don't have your normal financial aid package in the summertime. So we have funds to send you uh, abroad in the summer. Studying in our departments means getting outside of yourself as an American in terms of perspective, but also physically outside of the United States uh, to gain a, a perspective literally standing in another place in the world. 
So we do both. We we make them imagine, make students imagine the rest of the world, and then we also take them <laughs> to see it uh, directly. But uh, one more thing that we should say is that uh, uh, we try to shape uh, global citizens. Uh, I think that's that's one very important aspect of what I think is my my task, my mission. Um, meaning, you know, uh, teaching students to abandon the centrality of their perspectives and 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 trying to put themselves in the shoes of other people, of other countries, of other realities. And uh, and then I think it's, it's beneficial. It's a humbling experience, and it's beneficial for one's growth. Uh, so to be to be global citizens, you need to have uh, again this cultural literacy and also a sense of your political being. As, as a member of the commu a community in which you want to be active, not passive, active. So that's why we end up talking about systems and political organizations and uh, ways in which we can really uh, be, uh, 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 make our voices heard, you know, and develop that critical ability to evaluate uh, the messages that we get, especially in, in, in a context like the one in which we live, that we are bombarded by the media and information. And if we don't process that information critically, then uh, it's hard to, to be active in a, in a, um, with, with, with an adequate awareness of what happens. So reading any literary text, for example, that's a way to train in this particular um, uh, skill. I would say that it's a skill. Very, very crucial for, for our reality in which we live. Another myth that I always try to dispel is that the university is this kind of special bubble and then there is the outside world. No, no, because it is right here that we deal with the outside world and provide the critical vision on that world uh, in which we are always actors, never separated from it. Well, and one thing, so uh, in I'm gonna, I, this may be how this goes that each each one of us says something and it sort of rings a bell. Uh, so one of the, the ideas that both uh, Donatella and John have kind of gotten to is, is this idea of imagination and being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And this I think is in part largely what the humanities does is it sort of allows you a broader view of, uh, you know, trying to, trying to imagine what it's like in someone else's in another country uh, even if you're there uh, trying to understand that person. Uh, and so in my department, uh, one thing that I, that I didn't mention and I should is that um, we also have an archeologist on staff um, who has a dig in Italy. Uh, generally every summer, uh, she takes a number of students, uh, generally between about five and 10. And we have another, uh, another colleague of ours has a dig in Peru um, that she brings students to. Uh, and so, again, reading texts, uh, so if, if you sort of think of religion and classics uh, and then modern languages and cultures as, as primarily textual based, um, you know, reading and thinking about what it is to be in somebody else's shoes, uh, we also then, um, you are reading a material culture in these, in these disciplines and you're looking at objects that these people have and, and hold and used uh, and trying to reconstruct their culture. So within classics to reconstruct but I think within the modern languages and cultures also to, uh, to, to, to sort of reimagine uh, how these things are being used by different cultures. Uh, and, and Donatella's uh, husband is also very uh, engaged in uh, a program that we have, an interdisciplinary program, uh, partly uh, connected to religion and classics, and that is the uh, uh, Archaeology, Technology, and Historic Structures program. So, uh, again, all of these are, are, are really connected, and I think that's one of the real special things about uh, the University of Rochester and our humanities, uh, the study of humanities, is uh, we are all connected. We, we know each other, we communicate with each other, uh, we oftentimes work together, uh, help each other, um, and so we do have this sort of very collegial uh, atmosphere that I think um, the students benefit. I hope, I hope the students benefit from. I'm not sure if that's always the case, but I certainly, uh, I, that's her goal. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's something that uh, John, John and I were talking about a moment ago, the fact that there is this uh, very close connection, not only among us as faculty collaborating together, but also uh, between us and our students. Uh, there is this intimate situation in which classes are small, groups are small, we know each other, we work with each other, 
uh, we take them to places and share incredible experiences together that then remain with these students and remain with us for a long time. Now you touched this question of the uh, program, a special major in um, uh, archaeology, technology and historical structures. Yes, that's a sort of a hub that uh, involves uh, uh, your department, uh, Italian, our department, the engineering department, and um, uh, students who go to Arezzo, for example, in our semester program in Italian studies, also uh, benefit from instruction that is associated with this other program. So there is an interaction between the two programs because in Italy, uh, uh, students take a big tour at the beginning of the program uh, to visit uh, um, uh, antiquities, Roman and Greek antiquities, especially in southern Italy, from Rome down south. And they spent about 10 days, you know, uh, visiting these locations and uh, listening to lectures on site, which again, border uh, or, or group together archaeology, uh, structural studies uh, taught by an engineer and history. And then a little bit of anthropology and something of the classical culture too. So all this which is the, the uh, uh, excellent resource that we have on site in Italy. You know, it's really the, 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 the material that we use for, for these programs that are uh, based on the local resources. So uh, we take students to Italy, not to send them to the library specifically, but to, to go and see these things and think on site and, and touch you know, these objects. And again, this is a result of a, of a great collaborative uh, initiative that, that's been going on now for years. Wow, that I, I learned so much from all of your responses. Um, and you kind of anticipated my next question of how do the courses within your department connect to STEM in other fields around the university? You've already talked a little bit about archaeological um, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the name. Yeah, it's a complicated um, name. Archaeology, technology, and historical structures. There we go. I actually had a friend during undergrad who majored in that and absolutely loved it. Um, but could you tell me a bit more and our audience a little bit more about the connections between um, the courses in your department and STEM? So, so and I can courses? start with that. And I'll just, I'll just piggyback on, on something that Nick said earlier. University of Rochester is a, is a university of double majors. It's actually becoming a, a university with more and more triple majors. Triple majors were unheard of when I got here in 1993. And they were very reluctantly agreed uh, to through a petition process, but very rarely so. We have ambitious students. And so what it means is when you come to Rochester and let's say you're a STEM student, oftentimes it doesn't mean you're just going to be a STEM student. As you explore the other disciplines in social science and, and humanities, you will find that, that uh, you have other passions. Uh, and, and, I, and I think this is true for religion and classics. It is for us, it is very easy to double major in our departments. Uh, and there are many reasons to do so. Obviously there are the practical reasons, but I think also there's simply the, the, the reasons that uh, you come to the university in the first place. You want to make sure that you get broadly and deeply educated, not just in a specific uh, area as a means of obtaining a job and having a career, but these are the years of your personal and, and intellectual formation. You need to find out the authentic interests of the self. So we have people who come into religion and classics and modern languages drawn to what we're teaching in, in our courses and wanting to learn uh, languages and then realizing that since the only classes that are sequential really are the language classes, that it's easy to accommodate a second major in our class, in our department. Uh, if their science major is, has a very strict order of classes and prerequisites, they can still fit in a lot of our classes and actually become double majors. So we get a lot of double majors in our, in our two departments. Um, I will also point out that there are, um, even if you're an engineering major and only have say five courses beyond your program that you can take, the engineering school has done a, a lot to highlight uh, a broad opportunities. Usually there's some broad, broad opportunities that uh, the students can take. We have in our uh, department a couple of areas in particular where we've noticed a lot of engineering students moving through our, our programs. There is a 
uh, a summer program in engineering in Germany, in Berlin, Germany, that, that we get a lot of students uh, coming through the German program, uh, taking German to go on that program. And believe it or not, there is actually a, a, an optics program that, that in, through which you can go to Petersburg, Russia and study at the National Research University of Information Technologies, Mechanics and Optics in St. Petersburg. Uh, and so we have students uh, who are coming through Russian, learning some Russian so they can go and do this. So there are these very practical, specific uh, areas that you can identify in terms of the, you know, learn uh, enough German or Russian and go on these programs. But there's also this idea that we just get a lot of science students who say, look, I want a really broad education. And what, what religion and classics in my languages offers uh, is something that's very engaging. Languages are fun. It's, it's uh, the, the, the idea of going abroad is very appealing. Uh, and so we get a lot of those majors as well. And I'll, I'll let my colleagues also comment on this. Well, I would like to add that uh, uh, we attract students uh, in all kinds of disciplines, especially in the sciences. Uh, for example, I, I routinely have TAs, uh, undergraduate TAs in my classes. And um, one class that is especially popular across campus is uh, the course on Dante, because I talk about the Middle Ages, but talking about that moment is a way of uh, introducing history, introducing philosophy, introducing uh, the thought of antiquity, introducing religious issues, literary issues, uh, a lot of things. And um, well, this semester I have a physicist who's my TA, uh, coupled with a student of philosophy who has uh, expertise in theology as well. And they make an incredible couple. I mean, it's just uh, uh, incredible how their different skills uh, uh, interact and uh, and uh, produce, you know, uh, uh, interest in the, in the students who discuss these issues with them from these different perspectives. So that's another that's another positive thing that, that that we have students from all kinds of backgrounds. And, uh, and they find point of connections in, in our classes. Also, the, our courses are popular for take five programs. I have many, many students who, who come from different disciplines and they want to do a take five program in, uh, in modern languages and they choose Italian and Italian culture with components of religion and classics very often too, because they go, they go very well together. So that's another, another aspect, the take five year that, uh, that is, uh, I'm going to unmute and answer the question that just came in from Ben. What do students do while studying abroad? Can they take STEM courses while studying abroad? And uh, again, more and more frequently they can. I know that again, the engineering has a whole website of, of programs at, that allow students to who go abroad for a semester or a summer to actually take engineering classes while abroad. And I know that Education Abroad has a similar list for uh, the sciences uh, uh, writ large. Uh, even if you can't, as a science or a STEM student, uh, devote a whole semester abroad, uh, you can get away for a summer, especially if we're helping you pay for it. And that's really why uh, we have made sure that there is financial aid available for the summer courses and for the, uh, the, the, the spring break courses in, in uh, religion and classics, because those are times when that, that aren't really covered by your tuition package. So uh, these th you can either go abroad in a way that does not conflict with what you have to do in your STEM program, or pick sites abroad that allow you to, con to study a language, but take an engineering course in English, or if your language is high enough in the, in the language of the country. Although I think mainly they're going to places where they can take those classes in English. And I'd say one, one last, you know, if we're, uh, Evelyn, your, your original question about kind of how do STEM, how do our classes interact with STEM, uh, STEM majors and things like that? Uh, I think one thing that I, I try and avoid saying there's a practical reason to, to study classics and religion, um, because I think there is something more important than practical, and that is to understand uh, who you are and, and how you fit into the world. But uh, we have a lot of students, um, and, and I think this has been borne out by the data, who will double major or even just major, uh, but then will go on to um, medical school. And so there are a lot of um, people who will major in classics and or religion who then become med students. And what 
they often find, and this is, uh, I think, part, I don't know if it's special to our uh, URMC, um, but admissions offices in medical schools will look for students who have uh, studied the humanities in depth. Uh, I think in part because the, the study of medicine is so much about the study of the human uh, and, and the, the individual. And you know, certainly we want our doctors to know uh, epidemiology and, and microbiology, particularly now, and, and, and physiology. Um, but so much of it is, what, how do we deal with somebody who's at the end of life? And uh, the study of religion and the study of classics oftentimes engages very directly with the issues of, of death and uh, the afterlife. And so I think um, we will get a lot of students who are interested in, in medicine and, and I will tell them, I say, all of those med school applicants all have majored in biology or biochemistry or these other sorts of things. I said, you're going to be in the smaller pile of students who has a, you know, also a degree in classics and, and those admissions uh, people are gonna look at that and say, well, that's, that's interesting. They, they've thought about other things than uh, simply the Krebs cycle or um, uh, you know, whatever it is else they tell, uh, teach it over in, in the biology department, so. Uh, Nick, may I say something about uh, medieval medicine? <laughs> Well, again, within my discussions about Dante and Dante's poetry, and we are talking about the late uh, 13th century, beginning of the 14th century, I ran into this topic of uh, uh, medieval uh, medicine, which is a part of uh, philosophy, it's still philosophy. These uh, physicians are philosophers of nature. And guess what? They discuss their ideas through poetry in many cases, and uh, love, which is a big subject of uh, poetry, becomes also a scientific subject because these people discuss you know, human nature, human physicality and human spirituality in the same context. So talking about medieval poetry takes you all in all these ram ramifications along these various routes and, uh, and you see how things are really connected. Uh, I see another question has come through the chat here, uh, through the question and answers from Marguerite. If you want to major in a STEM field in the language, how difficult is it to take classes that fulfill both requirements? The, the STEM classes, will you'll, when you look at the different uh, major requirements, you'll see that clearly that there is really a, a strict order of, of, of classes you have to take, both the, um, the uh, sort of allied classes uh, like math or physics, and then, the, and then say the biology classes you need for the biology major. And there'll be a very strict order in which you need to take these classes. Uh, in modern languages and cultures and in religion and classics, uh, the only kind of strict adherence of order that you need to adhere to is, is that the order of the classes that you're taking the language in. If you're starting Russian, for instance, which is what I teach, uh, you're going to start at 101 and move forward, and you have to move 101, 102, 150, 101, 152, and so on. And it's that's that's in order. But as you as you uh, start to um, look at electives and core courses and the and the departmental requirements, those can be because the departmental requirements, the two uh, foundation courses are taught every semester. You can pick those up as as they're as as they are available in your schedule. And as for electives and, and core courses, those also will be at different times from different professors. My feeling is, and the experience of my, of, of my double majors has been that, uh, that fulfilling our major is easier than their own because we just have more flexibility. Excuse me, John, you said that you saw a question on the chat? In the Q&A box, actually. Oh, where is the Q&A? Oh, oh, it's a different place. Yeah, it's it's quirky in the Zoom webinar okay, setup. Okay, now I see it. I thought uh, that, that you were calling it Q&A, <laughs> but it was a chat instead. No, there's a different box. Okay, now I see it. Yeah. And I think to, to add to John's, uh, you know, that, that there is this flexibility, I would also encourage all of you, even if you were thinking, you know, I want to study biology or, or mechanical engineering or anything, uh, that it's never too late to, to start a language. Right, uh, that that uh, even a semester, two semesters, three semesters, four semesters, and your you know, you're the last two years of your uh, career, uh, that will offer you all of the you know many of the benefits. Um, maybe not fluency necessarily to to be able to study 
uh, in the language to go to Germany and study optics, uh, for example, in German. Uh, but certainly, you know, that um, those four semesters will give you uh, a window, as, as Donatella had mentioned, into uh, what it is to be German and how Germans think about the world and see the world and express themselves, uh, or if you do that in Latin or in Greek. Um, and uh, certainly, so I can speak from the classical languages, so Latin and ancient Greek, um, that by our, our goal is, um, since we don't need to teach conversational Latin or Greek, uh, certainly there are some of my, my colleagues who do use conversational uh, languages, uh, conversation to, to enhance the learning, uh, but our goal is to, to learn to read uh, classical literature. Uh, so for example, in my, uh, with our Greek cycle, um, a student could be reading Homer by, the, by their fourth semester. So uh, if you were to start the language late and you said, but really what I wanna do is I wanna read uh, Euripides in Greek. Um, that is, that is a, a, a true possibility. Uh, if you wanna read Virgil in, in Latin or Julius Caesar in Latin, uh, by, by fourth semester, you will be doing that. In fact, you'll be reading excerpts uh, well before that in, in, in Latin and Greek. So uh, just the, the, the benefits, I mean, it's sort of like exercise uh, that just because you're not gonna run a marathon doesn't mean you shouldn't run every once in a while, get a little exercise every once in a while. So even, even uh, a semester, two semesters, three semesters will, will do your, your brain and your soul uh, immense good. So I'd encourage you, regardless of what you're going to major in, and I certainly hope that you'd, you'd look at the humanities, um, look at those courses and say, well, these are gonna be interesting for their, for their own uh, purposes. Uh, you will get something, I, I know you will get something out of them. Now you touched this question of reading a text in its original language. And that, that is an amazing uh, possibility because uh, you know, when we show students translations, I, I teach Dante in translation, for example, with the Italian uh, text uh, uh, facing pages. And, uh, and I show them 10 different translations or 20 different translations. Then, you know, they say, oh my goodness. And then they realize that there is an interpretive issue at stake, that the translation is an interpretation. What is an interpretation? It's trying to figure out meaning. And so this, uh, this uh, ways of, of uh, opening up to the translation versus the original, it's another great, greatly uh, useful intellectual experience in itself. So, so Evelyn, I'd also like to, to add something, I think it's actually from your list, that I think is ap apropos of our conversation now. Um, as, our as our students who are watching the webinar are contemplating where they might go, um, I would like to address the question why they might choose University of Rochester as opposed to other universities. Um, and one of the first things that, that I want to say is that uh, coming to the University of Rochester, because we have a small uh, undergraduate student body, 5,000, a little more than 5,000 students, but we're a, a, an R1 that is a top tier research university, it's like having the best of both worlds. You come to the University of Rochester, you have a small college environment, a liberal arts college environment where you have a lot of interaction with your professors. And, and in the humanities in particular, small uh, student faculty ratios. But you also have a major research university where all of your professors are, are actively uh, researching and, 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 and going, into, going to conferences. Um, add to that the fact that across the street, uh, across Elmwood, you have a major research hospital at University of Rochester Medical Center. And uh, just a 10 minute shuttle ride away, you have a, um, a, one of the top ranked conservatories in the country, there are many advantages to coming here uh, over going to other places. Uh, and and uh, I, I just want to uh, underscore that. I mean, I, I still have, I'm still in contact with, with students I've taught 20 years ago. Uh, you establish relationships with your professors that are long lasting and significant. And you come by, as happened to me just a couple summers ago, uh, our offices in the summer with your with your kids and your and your new family and and uh, uh, we're, we're sort of part of your continuous movement in the world. That's something that doesn't happen everywhere. Maybe no, oh, sorry, Donna. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Nick. Oh. So uh, adding to the 
John, you make a really nice point about the that we are we are in the Goldilocks zone of of being small enough to be personal and big enough to have the sort of resources of a research one institution and the faculty of a of an R one institution. Uh, and I think one thing that so I I went to a, a major um, state university, major research state university, where I I knew my professors because I was in classics, so that was a small world. Uh, but certainly my my fellow classmates who were in STEM weren't able to get involved in research unless they were really, um, you know, sort of put themselves out there. Um, and then I have friends who went to small, uh, small liberal arts colleges of 1,500, 2,000 people where undergraduate research was a, a, a big push. Um, and of course, but they didn't necessarily have all of the research resources. Uh, I think one of the really special things at the University of Rochester being in this Goldilocks zone is the fact that we do encourage uh, undergraduate research and we have a lot of outlets for students to do undergraduate research, whether it be in the humanities, I've had students uh, working with me and certainly in the, in the STEM fields, working with faculty there where they can, uh, by, you know, by the end of their careers, they're undertaking uh, real honest to God research, uh, thinking about um, major issues either in STEM or in the humanities. Uh, and then they have outlets for them to, to publish that, whether that be locally. Uh, so we have a, a, um, a research fair every year in the spring where students can sort of advertise what they've done. Uh, but we also then have, um, we, we've sent students to conferences. Uh, there's the, the National Conference of Undergraduate Research every year uh, that generally attracts a lot of smaller liberal arts college students. Uh, but we send, I think we're probably sending 20 plus students every year uh, to, to uh, essentially publish their, their research abroad, letting, letting other faculty, letting other professors, letting other students know what it is that they're doing. Um, and so I think this is really one of those things that makes the University of Rochester special uh, because we do have both the resources and the size um, to encourage both of those. And I will simply add on the question of undergraduate research that in, the, in MLC, in the Department of Modern Languages and Cultures, every spring we run an, uh, our own undergraduate research conference uh, based off of student research in our department. So we too encourage uh, students to uh, and work with students on, on research projects that become capstone writing in their, in their uh, major uh, and future writing samples for graduate school applications and so on and so forth. And maybe even who knows uh, the beginnings of a longer research project that they might pursue in graduate school. Awesome, thanks for reading my mind, John, um, with the questions. I guess we can talk more about post-grad opportunities for students who study both modern languages and cultures and classics. So what would you say um, students who study these subjects have the abilities to do in terms of career after they graduate? Let me start with what, with what Nick said about being a, a classics major and going to medical school. Uh, you can do that. Uh, you can also be a Russian major, a single solitary Russian major and go to Harvard Law School, which is what one of my grads did. Uh, you know, you don't have to have the traditional pre-med or pre-law major to do these things. Now, admittedly, when I asked that student, you know, did, did Russian, was Russian the deciding factor for you, do you think, to get into Harvard Law School? And she said, well, it certainly set me apart, but I think those three courses in logic also helped for the, uh, the LSAT, and that's, that's true too. Uh, because so many of our majors are double majors, their careers are everywhere. But what, our, what a double major in our, in our two departments does is it sets you apart. It's very important when you're applying to competitive graduate schools and medical schools and law schools that you have the, the, the prerequisite knowledge and coursework to your name. But if you want to stand out, if you want to look different, if you want to look like someone who has pushed themselves and, and sort of broadened their, their intellectual horizons, having a double major in something like, you know, in, in, in the classics, for instance, or in Russian, always something that catches people's attention these, these days, um, is a way of saying, I challenge myself. You know, these are not easy languages. Learning any language is not easy. Getting, you know, a sustained proficiency in language is not an easy thing, but 
I think these these schools and these graduate programs and these uh, employers are looking for globally minded uh, employees and 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 global citizens. Something that Donatella was talking about earlier. Uh, so. While our students do get jobs in the field, like for instance, the Russian major um, in, uh, uh, who studied with us uh, and graduated in 2003, went on to, to work for 17 years at the Council of International Education Exchange, lived in St. Petersburg for seven years as an on-site director, became their, their I got to read it, his job title uh, is um, uh, program, Director of Program Development and Traveling Worldwide for CIEE for that. You can do that. Another one of our Russian studies majors went on to found a vodka company in Russia, which sounds very much like a cliche, but it's it's a very high end vodka, Zir Z Y R, that you can find in fine liquor stores everywhere. Not that I'm telling you to go there. I'm just saying that was a a particular career path that Russian opened up for him. Sometimes these cultures force you into paths that. <laughs> I remember when I was in Poland with those vodkas. Uh, something that you have to confront <laughs> with. Um, well, the careers, I mean, uh, something that speaks uh, for itself is what some of our alumni do. Uh, uh, we have uh, one uh, graduate, one graduate in Italian studies who teaches for us, uh, Andrew Korn in Italian. He's a lecturer in Italian. And uh, so he's, he's right in our department and that's one career. I have uh, many former students who are in academia, art historians, several art historians. Uh, I'm just going you know, through the, the, the ones that come to my mind immediately, but there are many. Um, a journalist in Chicago, a freelance journalist in Chicago. Um, Another one who is uh, coming next week to speak to my class about sport and politics in the Middle East, he just published a book on this topic and he is uh, a double major in history and in Italian and uh, teaches in a business school. Um, I have uh, two uh, alumni who are uh, teachers in high schools. So they organize the um, international programs and, uh, and exchange programs with Italy. Uh, one of them actually who lives in Boston has organized uh, an exchange program with high school students in Arezzo, which is uh, the, the, the place where we have our own program. So much she was attached to it. She, she participated in the program for three years in a row. <laughs> and so that became you know, a life-changing experience for her. Um, I have two Episcopalian priests. <laughs> one is about to be ordained, the other one is already ordained. Uh, and the one who is about to be ordained uh, got a PhD in English at Princeton. Another one is um, uh, about to enter the law school to become a pub public advocacy lawyer. And they all feel that their experience within Italian studies just shaped their careers gave them the hints, you know, for what they later on pursued. Um, and we collaborate, we still collaborate uh, with one of these students who is, they're both in New York, these two Episcopalian priests. Um, I just did uh, a recording for uh, the Dante Society of America, which promoted this project of uh, uh, various people conversing on one of Dante's cantos, you know, to celebrate the uh, centennial, seventh centennial of Dante's death. And so we did a recording on a canto together with one of these students, a conversation which was a way to revisit our uh, past, you know, as uh, in the classroom, but also to, to see the, the new perspectives that we have now on our reality and, uh, and to what extent that experience applies to what we have around. We called our recording, actually he called it a call to action. <laughs> It was a reading of, of a cant of Dante's Paradiso. And I think I should probably add, uh, so both Donatella and John have, have hit all of the, the, the major hit law school and medical school and, and the, the, the professional world, uh, certainly business. Uh, there are plenty of, of people in that, that go on to careers in, in business who have majored in, in various humanities. Um, but also, I think what, what is special about the University of Rochester, and certainly in our Department of Religion and Classics, we are a small department uh, compared to a lot of other universities. Um, 
but we have sent uh, some of our students to some of the finest graduate schools. Uh, we currently have a, a student at the University of Texas studying uh, for his PhD in classics. Uh, UT is one of the one of the the, the really good uh, graduate programs. I have another one who started this year, even uh, despite uh, COVID, he started his PhD program at Ohio State, um, which is another excellent program. Uh, our religion program has, has sent people to Harvard to study uh, religion there. Uh, and I think one of the, the, the things that kind of sets us apart in that way is because we get to know our students so well, um, I think we are able to write uh, really personal letters of recommendation and we can really recommend these students to these graduate programs um, more than um, you know at a, at a, at a huge program might be able to do where a student is sort of shuffled uh, through a variety of, of faculty members. This not necessarily that graduate school is what you should uh, you know, necessarily have to aspire to. I think there are plenty of other career options, uh, but it is certainly a good one. I mean, I had a, I had a fine time in graduate school and I think I've done pretty well uh, after that. Um, and I think one thing that, that both MLC, this, so I think uh, John and Donatella's students, and I, I hope my students, um, they come away with a real passion for the, for the field, for the, these disciplines. And after four years, just want to keep going. They want, they want to do more. And that's, I think, the, the, the purest reason to do graduate study. Um, and so there are just, uh, just a, a variety of things you can do after you get done here. Um, and I think we set students in a good place uh, to succeed in, in whatever they decide to, to pursue. By the way, I didn't mention that our lecturer in Italian, he's a PhD from uh, University of Pennsylvania. So after graduating from MLC, he got a PhD in Italian in Pennsylvania and then came back. So that's another, yeah, one of the graduate careers. Awesome. I think we're running a little bit low on time. I think this is an excellent place to end with all the postgrad opportunities. We covered all the points that I was hoping to go over that I think are incredibly important for our prospective students to know. Um, so thank you to our panelists for joining us here today, taking time out of their hectic days and teaching and the pandemic to um, speak with you all. I will note that if you do have any questions, um, you can email me. I'll put my email address in the chat. So if you want to connect with anyone here, I can be that bridge. Um, for those of you who might be watching this later, my email is on the University of Rochester admissions website. There will be a picture of my face, my name, and my email address. So you can reach out to me that way as well. Um, but thanks again, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Um, and hopefully we'll see your application soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.